Thank you so much for coming, and uh, it's nice uh, to be here and uh, see you all. And um, we might have many different opinions uh, on this issue, I don't know. We'll see about that. But I want to feel that um, I want you to feel totally free to express your own views. And it's mostly uh, it's more interesting if you have many different views. Um, um, and um, I, I, this uh, presentation is totally new, so uh, you have to forgive me if I don't know it all by heart. Um, hopefully I can do this presentation many times and then I will learn it uh, better. <laughs> um, I'm use this. So uh, I have a uh, small exercise for you. Now I would like you to think about one or more animals uh, in your life that you have felt some kind of connection to. Are you thinking about that? So can I see with your hands raised how many could think about one or more animals that you felt some connection to? Oh, that's a lot. Thank you. And um, have you had in your life one or more animals that you felt uh, loved by uh, or liked by? Can I see? Look around in the room and keep your hands up. See, that's a lot of love, isn't it? What does it tell us? It tells us, I think, that we care about animals and animals care about us. Uh, the deer suffered for two hours in spite of calls to the police. This was um, a headline in the Swedish paper Metro a couple of years ago. It was a deer who had been hit by a bus, and the driver uh, talked to a journalist, and he said, We are just standing there waiting, and it sucks. Children are walking past. Everyone is standing around and can, can see how the animal is hurting. What does this tell us about animals and our connection to them? Well, that uh, animals that are close to us, family members, is not only them who, who matters to us. It's also animals who are totally strangers to us who matter. We don't want uh, animals to suffer. And uh, I don't want uh, animals to suffer either, and that's why I started a proje uh, project I call A Year for the Animals. And uh, I crowdfunded uh, for this, so people have been generously uh, supporting me, so I can work full time for animal rights uh, during the whole year. I did it also last year. Um, and uh, doing lectures, this kind of lectures, is, is a part of it, but also other kinds of activities. Uh, before that, I worked in the peace movement uh, first as a non-violence trainer, so I was facilitating workshops uh, in mostly in Sweden, but also in other countries like Sudan, South Sudan, Colombia, and Palestine. And uh, yeah, and then I also uh, was uh, for a few years active against the Swedish weapons export. Um, I grew up. Um, I should say that. Um, Caring for animals uh, wasn't uh, something that uh, I had with me from the start. It's, it's uh, actually a surprise for me that I'm standing here talking about animals with you. It was not that I didn't that I disliked animals, uh, but I didn't care about animals very much as a child growing up. Here you can see uh, myself and my brother Christian, we're twins, and uh, our cousin Petra. Can you see who am I? <laughs> what do you think? The guy, the guy in the middle. In the middle. You're right. Very good. Most people actually guess that. I'm very impressed. <laughs> yes. See, we're eating bottles here. Uh, and I grew up in a middle class family, I would say. This is uh, from outside of a house. Actually, I, I'm staying here. Uh, this is the same very house. And uh, now, 41 years later. <laughs> Uh, uh, I mean, when I'm here, I don't live here, I live in Stockholm now. Um, we never talked about politics, we never talked about animal rights. Um, um, I, the only connection really I had with animals was as meat on my plate. 
and, and nothing else. Um, for me, uh, <clears throat> nothing uh, happened uh, with me in animals before I went to university. Anyone recognize this? Uh, Lund. 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 Yes, the city library in Lund. And uh, one day, <clears throat> when I had uh, started as a student there, I went into the library and I found uh, this book, Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. Anyone who have read it, perhaps? This is like a classic in the animal rights movement uh, literature. And um, I had heard about the book and I knew that it, it's about how we humans treat animals and uh, how we treat them badly. And I flipped through the book and uh, I thought it looked very interesting. But uh, eventually I put it back uh, on the bookshelf. Why do you think I put it back? I didn't borrow it. I went out of there. And one can guess. The lack of interest, maybe. You uh, didn't want to read it, so just... Mm. No, I, 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 I was interested, actually. Uh, I thought it, it looked very interesting. Yeah. So what could it be? Truth can hurt. Sorry? The truth can hurt. The truth can hurt. And uh, how, in this case, you think? I think that you protect yourself a lot from, uh, from actually realizing what, what you're doing when you're eating meat. Mm. And uh, having a wake up call from that is probably cool. <coughs> Uh, I think you're right. I think that's part of the answer. That was also a more practical answer. And by this time, I still live with my parents. Uh, so I commuted to, to the university. And they were still eating meat, as they are today, unfortunately. And I was thinking, oh, then I have to cook my own food. And that's such a hassle. Uh, so I was lazy. And uh, that was the main reason, actually. But uh, I uh, eventually uh, left home and, uh, and um, f found my own uh, place in Lund, a dormitory, and I bought the book uh, by then, and then I read it, the whole thing, I think, for in a weekend. Um, and, um, yeah, because I, I was thinking, if I would read a book, I would become a vegetarian. And actually, that was exactly what happened when I did read the book. Uh, because I saw, uh, I, and I was horrified by how we treat animals, how we can lock them up in small spaces during their whole lives, how we can end their lives uh, at a very young age, just because of the taste of meat, just because we want this taste. Um, and uh, I think of myself, as I think most people do, as a generally a, a decent person, um, someone that doesn't want to cause harm to other living beings. But I was beginning to question myself, and that's connected to what you said, how come that I, did I uh, hurt these animals and actually indirectly kill them by eating meat for many, many years? It must be in uh, many, many uh, individuals that I was responsible for, for killing indirectly. How come did I sometimes uh, pet animals and the next time eat uh, meat of animals? Uh, because I think somewhere in the back of my mind I knew that someone, some uh, person has to kill an animal for me to eat this meat. Um, this is a kind of a collision uh, that sometimes happens between a value uh, which I and many others have, uh, you're not supposed to cause unnecessary suffering on uh, any other living being. Uh, and an action, uh, which is to, uh, in this case, to eat uh, meat and to be responsible for that suffering. That's a collision and this is an example of what in the field of psychology is called cognitive dissonance. Have you heard about, about cognitive dissonance? Yeah, dissonance. I see many yeah. nodding. Um, and when this happened, I mean, this is a kind of a conflict. And uh, the brain has a choice uh, in this case. One choice is, of course, to change the action. You can stop eating meat 
and uh, not be responsible for killing and hurting animals anymore. Uh, but there is another choice, and that's for the brain to reinterpret the situation until it no longer looks like a conflict anymore. And this is actually, uh, I think, more common actually than, than changing the actions, because it takes more usually for the brain to change actions than to do this reinterpretation. And this is actually, uh, this question is what this lecture is all about, and we will get back to that in many different ways. Um, picture of strawberries, uh, I want to ask you uh, what kind of a thing, uh, thoughts pop into your mind when you see this picture? You can just shout out some different words of, of things you think Summer. about. Summer. Tasty. Tasty. Sweet. Sweet. Anything else? Food. Food. Pesticides and chemicals. Ah, okay. Pesticides and chemicals. <laughs> Uh, let's imagine if I had a, a bowl of strawberries, unfortunately I don't have that, but if I had a bowl of strawberries and I put it here in front of you, what would change? You would eat them. <laughs> you would eat them? Yeah. Anything else? Would you be able to uh, uh, feel it even more, these kind of feelings, you think? Oh, yeah. 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 Maybe even uh, smell it? The strawberries. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, uh, what if I took a knife and uh, cut up some strawberries? How would you feel about that? <coughs> Why? Is it okay? No. Yeah. Okay, another picture. Um, what kind of thoughts uh, pop into your mind when you see this picture? Cute. Sorry? Cute. Cute? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Trust. Trust? A baby. Baby. Photoshop. Because a baby don't stand like this. <laughs> uh -huh, okay. Innocent? Innocent. Captivity. Captivity. No one thinks about food. No? Well, somebody <laughs> might shout, bacon. Uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe that tells something about the crowd I have here in front of me. Maybe, I don't know. I have never, never tried this. Uh, both experiment in the uh, time before. Okay, so if I would have a pig here and put it in front of you, would that change anything about what you were thinking? No. No? Depends. What does it depend on? The age, how big it is, because you don't eat a pig like this. Uh -huh. It's too small. Uh -huh. You eat them when you are a hundred years. <coughs> right, right. And then you think it's more food when, when they're large, mm -hmm. not when they're babies, because no one eats a baby. Right. So maybe I would show us a picture next six time months. when I'm bigger. Do you want to think six months is a baby? Mm -hmm. Maybe no. we should show a picture of a lamb next time. Uh -huh. Because I know that's like usually four or six months when you eat them, depending right. on the year. Right. Uh, so. Good. What if uh, I gave you uh, a knife? Uh, would anyone be willing to, if I, if I had a pig here, to put a knife in the pig? Anyone? No. No? starving. If you were starving? Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, what if I had a knife and I began to, to stab it? Would anyone want to stop me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> How many would want to stop me? Can I see a show of hands? <laughs> okay, that's money. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, and that says also something about how we think about food uh, and animals, of course. Uh, now, I don't know what you usually eat, because I haven't uh, asked you that. Of course, that uh, is also a factor in the equation. But I think generally, whether you eat meat or not, uh, people don't feel like taking a knife and sticking it in a, in a pig. I mean, there is a difference between cutting a strawberry and cutting a pig. I think uh, everyone basically uh, thinks like that, uh, regardless of what he or she is eating. 
Uh, and this is, I think, because we do feel empathy for animals. That's something uh, in general for the human population. We do feel connectedness to animals. This is at least my experience and what uh, the research that I have been studying uh, says. Uh, so why is it then that we keep on eating meat? I mean, uh, because there are very few uh, that don't eat meat and other animal products. Uh, one um, survey said that uh, if you count both vegans and vegetarians, it's about 10% of the Swedish population. And I think that's a quite high number. I, I doubt if it's that many. But still, about at least 90% uh, still eat uh, meat in Sweden. Uh, so why is that when we feel empathy? And I've been thinking about this for a couple of years and I found some answers that I want to share with you. Uh, and you can break it down into psychological, sociological and political reasons for eating meat. So uh, let's start with psychological reasons. Um, can anyone think of some psychological reasons why we eat meat? For condition to it. Mm -hmm. Say more about that, uh, how? how um, we saw that at a very young age, uh, many doctors still recommend it for children. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just part of our society, right. it's, it's the norm. Yes, it's the norm. And if you try to break the cycle, people would say to you, but we've always eaten meat. Yeah. Don't go against tradition, culture. Exactly. Really. Um, yes, exactly. We are conditioned to eat meat, and uh, here is a picture of me uh, and my brother at the summer vacation where we eat salami and fish and, and egg. Uh, we get our worldview from our parents, and as a child, it's very difficult to challenge that worldview, especially when you don't get an alternative. It's very seldom, I think, that parents ask. So do you want to eat meat or do, don't you want to eat meat? Do you want to eat meat or do you want to have a, a vegan uh, diet? I don't think that happens uh, very much at all. Uh, and of course when you're small enough you can't make that decision. Uh, but even when you grow older, uh, very few or any get that choice. Um, how many here have seen an Inconvenient Truth, uh, the climate documentary of Al Gore. There's a few of you, yeah. Um, but many, as this cartoon showed, many still choose a reassuring lie. <laughs> and this is because we as uh, humans are generally conservative. We like uh, what we have, what we know. Even if it's a lie, we like it better uh, in general. We don't like, uh, as someone pointed out here, when, when uh, we have to change. Um, and one thing that uh, strengthens this, that we keep on to our worldview, even though the facts are not with us, is uh, a phenomenon in psychology called confirmation bias. Anyone have heard of it? Uh, can I see some hands? If anyone? Uh, confirmation bias is uh, uh, a phenomenon that strengthens uh, what you have and uh, also your, it reflects your behavior. To always look for things that confirm what you already know and feel is right. Let's take an example. Uh, you're reading a paper and you're seeing, uh, and uh, let's say this is a meat eater. Uh, as a meat eater, he's reading a paper and he says, it sees the headline, study shows meat is good for your health. I don't know how likely this study headline is because it really doesn't, <laughs> but uh, the paper is not always <coughs> true, right? Uh, but as a meat eater, uh, he, he uh, goes directly for this uh, headline and wants to read the article. Why? Yeah, because he wants to feel, ah, oh, I'm on the right track. Um, I'm doing something good, I'm eating my meat. And he also wants to tell his uh, brother or friend who is a vegetarian, and look here, I found some evidence that supports my, my worldview. 
How about if we have a meat eater uh, who, says, who sees another kind of headline? Uh, like this, meat causes cancer, or maybe uncover video shows animals in misery. What kind of reaction do you think she will get? I don't think she will read it. No. Denial. Denial. Everything. That's also very strong, yeah. Or everything gives, gives, gives cancer. Or right. Like this is, uh, the misery thing is like, yeah, but it's just a uh, one time happening. Yeah. It's not the normal. Exactly. And we don't uh, even, I think, often think about this, but what often happens is that we try to ignore this. We see the headline, but we don't read the article, because we don't want to find out more. We try to focus only on what supports. I mean, this does, doesn't happen every time, of course, but often it does. And now uh, I want you to talk about this. Uh, can you remember an occasion when you found something that confirmed your view that eating meat is right and good? I, I guess for at least most of you, once in your life, you had that, uh, <laughs> that uh, diet and thinking. And also, can you remember another occasion when you tried to ignore or stay away from something that could threaten the idea that you have about eating meat is good. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's not easy, I know, because sometimes when you do this so at automatically, so you might not remember, but, but try it if you can think about it. Okay? Thanks. Anyone else? You 
did you find someone as some examples? I, it can be tricky, I think. Uh, I have problems myself to find it. Especially if you're unaware about the phenomena. <coughs> it can be tricky. We'll move on. Um, and we're used to just eating meat and, um, and not thinking about where the food comes from. But sometimes it shows its ugly face. And <laughs> here's a guy who found this when he bought uh, chicken, chicken wings. And he said uh, like this to a reporter, I saw an eye looking at me. I just yelled. And it was a pure reflex. And then I had to go out and vomit. Uh, and he also added to the journalist, I'm thinking after this incident to become a vegetarian. <laughs> he had re realized where food uh, came from. And um, another uh, strong um, psychological factor in, I think, everyone's life is that we want to see ourselves as a good person doing good things. Uh, we don't like uh, information that contradicts this. Um, so, when the meat eaters see a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, it reminds them about their own food choices, that it's actually a, a choice. And uh, they don't want to think about that usually, because uh, I think many are aware that it can cause suffering and, and aware about the killing. Okay, come on. Uh, and this is, uh, can cr create uh, <coughs> guilt. And guilt is not a very nice feeling, that's something we want to avoid. So what do you do then when you feel this guilt? Well, some meat eaters, they, what do they do? What do you think? Defend. They defend. And they attack also. They defend their own choices and they attack the vegetarian or vegan. Because as long as they attack someone, they don't have to focus on their own choices. Have any one of you experienced this before? Yes. I see some nodding. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly what your food choices are. Um, uh, but I think this is very common. Um, and, uh, but some people, uh, even very young ones, um, break free from these psychological ties that we have and think for themselves, <coughs> even though their parents uh, don't do it. And I was thinking we, we should see a small video clip for two minutes. Cortou assim? Cortou. O quê? Pra gente poder comer, porque senão a gente ia ter que engolir inteiro. Mas por quê? É pra comer, amor. Igual corta o boi, corta a galinha. Ah, a carinha? Ninguém come também. Ninguém come a galinha? É, eu já li mais. É? É. Quanta gente comeu os animais? Eles morrem. É. Por quê? Pra gente poder comer, meu amor. Porque eles morrem. Não gosto que eles morrem. Eu gosto que eles ficam em pé. Feliz. Então tá bom. Então a gente não vai comer mais não, tá bom? Tá. Esses animais são pi... Tem que cuidar deles, não comer. <risos> tá certo, meu filho. Então come a parte da batata e do arroz. Tá bom. Por que você tá sonhando? Não tô chorando, não. Ah. Eu tô emocionada com você. Eu tô fazendo uma coisa saindo. <risos> então come. Não precisa comer o povo, não, tá? Tá bom. How many have seen this video before? Can I see? Awesome. It's a viral... Uh, uh, what do you say? What do you say? A viral... What? It's viral, yeah. Clip. yeah. It has been seen by millions and millions. This was Luis, a three-year-old Brazilian kid. Um, and he asked the very important questions, uh, por que? Why? Why do we kill animals? It's so rare that uh, at, at least children ask this question, why? But it's so important. So, uh, what about sociological reasons for eating meat? Uh, sociology is about how we humans behave in groups uh, in, in the wider society. Uh, can you find some sociological reasons? 
grow in many societies, it's a sign of wealth that you have on your table. You have a, a, like a wide range of uh, meat from different right. animals. So the richer you are, the more meat you will be consuming. So very good. So it's a question of status. Uh, and yeah. she, very good. Yes. Anything else? Tradition. Tradition, of course. Yeah. What what could that look like? Tradition. Christmas. Like, right. And also like we've, we've always been doing it, so mm. we should just keep on doing it. Right. But uh, yeah, like Christmas, and it's even more important that these special occasions that we eat meat. Yeah. And we found that too. Get the school of behavior as well. Uh, people talk about the restaurant that they were at, and how right. they had a good steak, and uh, I mean, everyone wants to be a part of a discussion. Or right. Right. If you're a vegetarian, it can be more difficult. Yes. Yeah, and I also think the fact that we don't want to be an inconvenience for others. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say like, ah, I, I eat meat, or I don't eat meat at home when I cook, but if I get invited, I don't want to tell them, oh, don't prepare some vegetarian vegan for me, I don't want to be a nuisance. So I think a lot of people do that, because it's just more socially acceptable to eat meat right. than not to. Yeah. I think that's a very strong force <laughs> for, for humans to try to fit in and belong to the group. Yeah, so we're going to look at some of them. <coughs> and uh, um, yeah, so when we're old enough, uh, parents, of course, let us out in, in society uh, to be with, with friends and go to school and so on. And almost anywhere, as you have mentioned, uh, our worldview is confirmed. Like, almost everyone is eating meat. And that, of course, strengthens uh, what we're doing. And already before we start school, we are taught about how to, what kind of connection we should have to animals and who are they to us. And this is from a book I found uh, as, uh, of one of my nephews. Um, and it tells us what we're supposed to do with the milk. Uh, and as you see, uh, it's very clear that it's for human consumption. We don't see a calf suckling on, on, on the cow, right? Taking uh, as it is in the, in the wild. Uh, in the same book, there is a hen, and we can see very clearly, well, eggs are, of course, for human consumption. It's not uh, uh, um, a small uh, chicken coming out of the egg. That's not the purpose of, of hens. So I think this book is maybe for like three years old, four years old, to learn these things. And uh, some of you mentioned norms before, and, and I want to talk, what is a norm? Um, a very strong norm, as an example, in our society in Sweden, is that if you meet someone for the first time, what do you do? You shake hands. Um, and I had a British friend uh, who came over, and I took him to my work before, and uh, he got to meet my colleagues. And, um, he uh, hugged them instead of shaking their hands for the first time. He, he was a total stranger for them, but he hugged them. And uh, I was shocked and they were shocked. <laughs> uh, and I think this is not a, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think this is a British tradition. I think, <laughs> I think that was his personal style. He was a bit special. He wanted to be really uh, feel, um, feel love and feel compassion to, to anyone. And, and I think he, want, he liked to break the norms, um, to try to challenge the norms. Well, anyway, it was when uh, he came and broke this norm that it became evident to me. I didn't really think about why, why we shake hands. And because if you have met one for the first time and then you meet maybe a second time, many times in Sweden, you hug that person, right? And that's quite specific norms about how you greet one another, right? And we don't think about it. And this is what a norm is. It's a, some kind of different behaviors that it's so uh, common. It's like unspoken rules. We have them, we don't talk about them, and we don't think about them normally. Until it's broken. Then we begin to think about it. 
And then it's like you're going, if, if you're a meat eater, if you have been a meat eater your whole life, you buy a hot dog uh, at the stand, a meat hot dog, and you don't begin to think every time, oh, is it ethical for me to buy this hot dog? What, what uh, kind of uh, repercussions will this have in our society? No, you don't think about it, you just do it. Uh, okay, I have to check. I think I had a video here. <laughs> Yes, about another strong norm in our society, it's for us men, and um, it's the um, thinking that if you're a man, you need meat, uh, that is connected to masculinity. And these uh, norms can be strengthened by commercials, and we're going to see a commercial, do you want to help me again? Uh, please? I am man, hear me roar, the number's too big to ignore, and I'm way too hungry to settle for chick food. Cause my stomach's starting to growl, and I'm going on the prowl for a Texas double whopper. Man, that's good. Oh yes, I'm a guy. I'll admit I've been fed quiche. Way tofu, bye bye. Now it's for whopper beef I reach. I will eat this meat till my any turns into an Audi. I am scarred. I am incorrigible. And I need to scoff a big burger, beef, bacon, jalapeno, good thing down. Texas double whopper. Eat like a man, man. What do you think about this? All in America. Yeah, all in America. I think I have I've heard that this is actually being shown on Swedish television yeah, as well. I remember that. You remember it, yeah. But you would hope that many people feel it funny and exaggerated, as I think many of you feel. But that sounds something maybe about how the culture has been progressing. I hope. Um, yes. And it, the, the thing with norms is, of course, also concerned with the norm of meat. You don't see it until someone chooses something else. But it only take uh, it, it's only take it, it only takes a vegan or a, a vegetarian to choose something else for the meat eater to see uh, what you, that choice. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's of course uh, the same with, uh, with the hug, uh, but it only takes um, one person to break the norm for it to be, to be visible. Um, and because even though norms are strong and the norm of meat eating in Sweden and many other countries is strong, uh, the hopeful thing is, for me, um, who wants to work for the animals, is that it only it takes uh, this uh, person, only one really, to shake the norm and not to break it totally, but to challenge it. Um, and then a new norm can begin to form. And uh, now, actually, last year and this year, uh, I have seen more and more people talking about the veggie norm, or vegan norm even. Um, where certain institutions, companies and organizations uh, say that we will have a vegetarian food, it's all mostly vegetarian food, sometimes maybe vegan even, uh, as a default position. Like this is the normal thing. If you want to meet, have meat, you can get it, but then you have to request it uh, specially. To switch it uh, was uh, compared to before, where if you were a vegetarian or vegan, you had to request it as special food, it's called often in, in Sweden. So uh, this is uh, beginning a little bit to, to happen and, um, and we'll see uh, in just a couple of years, maybe the norm has changed even more. So what about political reasons uh, for eating meat? And when I think about uh, politics, I think about everything that has to do with society, about economy, about uh, the structure of our society, what, uh, and also political decisions, of course. 
Can you see any political reasons why we still need to meet today? Well, it's not popular to push the veggie agenda. Uh -huh. I mean, politicians would, re otherwise they, they risk uh, becoming unpopular, mm. so... It's true, even for them, uh, to challenge a norm can be uh, costful. Yeah, that's true. It's radical. Yeah. No other way to describe it. I mean, uh, yeah. It's a radical standpoint to, to, uh, to not accept uh, uh -huh. eating meat. Yeah. Any radicals in, uh, in politics will be expelled uh -huh. pretty quickly. Anything else? Anything supporting? Yes. The supporting industry of this industry is supplying some jobs that uh -huh. it is ridiculous from their point of view to stop it. Right. And if, if you believe or not, but I believe that in Sweden, for example, I don't know how to approach it. Is no, I. That's it. Just, just it like that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and you, you said uh, I think company and jobs. You said, and of course there are huge uh, financial benefits of supporting the meat industry. Uh, this is Ala, which is the main Swedish um, milk producer, and of course they have huge budgets also to. Uh, affect our uh, behaviors, our uh, consumption, with uh, in media, of course, with PR and, and commercials, etc., etc. They uh, focus on strengthening the psychological and sociological reasons for eating meat through uh, their money and their influence. Uh, this is uh, what they want to show us. This is what they want us to think about when we consume milk or uh, eggs or or meat. Uh, of course, with a bit different uh, pictures. It says uh, here, invest in the future. Um, they want to say that uh, when we're consuming animal products, we are in fact helping animals. Um, uh, when we take their milk and even when we kill them uh, because we are in, in kind of a sometimes to talk about a contract between us and the animals we help them with food and etc they help us with milk and meat and so on and uh, for a long time I swallowed this uh, I uh, drank their milk and also their messages um, but uh, a couple of years ago, I wanted to check out for myself, how is it in, in the meat industry? Um, and I actually called a, a dairy farm close by where I used to live uh, and asked, can I come for a, like a study visit? Um, and he asked suspiciously, are you an animal rights activist? <laughs> uh, but I said no, and I wasn't really an activist at that time. Uh, and I said I was a local politician, and that was uh, true, I was a little bit active in a local party at that time. So he let me come with a couple of others from my party. Um, and this um, uh, calf uh, was um, the most important meeting uh, from that visit. Um, and uh, when I stood, uh, maybe, I don't know, I don't think you can see it, but here it says, eager, perfect. And uh, when I stood looking into the eyes of the calf, I was thinking, is it really perfect to live? They live 24 7 in this small uh, space. It, it stops here, and there is another calf inside. They live like this for months and months. And I asked the farmer who took us around, how long uh, can the calf be with the cow, with the, his or her mother, before they're separated after birth? And he said, um, about a day, if they're together longer, the mother moves something fierce after having been separated. How is it in the wild? Now, not so many cows are in the wild, but uh, if they were in the wild, wild uh, they would uh, um, uh, take the milk from the mother for eight to ten months. And of course, uh, create this very strong bond between mother and child. And now try to imagine the cow uh, when they take away the newborn child, how that feels. 
Try to imagine what it would feel like for you if you had your child taken away right after birth. And um, it's very true. I mean, now he let me come to a dairy farm, but most of the time when you want to get in there, and especially if you're critical, if they know that you're critical and you want to find out how it is, it's very difficult to get into, to see the industry and what it looks like. Especially if you're a journalist or a photographer, uh, most of the um, factory farms won't let you in. They don't want people to see how the food is produced. So what shall we do if we want more information about this? Well, there are different organizations that go uh, in there unannounced uh, because of the need to see what happens. Uh, one of those organizations is uh, Juleth's Alliance and the Animal Rights Alliance. And they've been taking pictures uh, from different um, yeah, animal farms for many years now. And I have a clip of about five minutes. Uh, it's in Swedish, but the images are the most important uh, to see, I think. Få djurfabriker är så väl dolda för omvärlden som fågelfabrikerna. Trots att kycklingar är de djur som slaktas i störst omfattning i Sverige syns de aldrig till. De lever hela sina liv instängda i jättelika hangarer utan att någonsin få se solen. Kycklingar är precis som andra fågelungar beroende av sina föräldrar den första tiden. Men kycklingarna kläcks i maskiner. När de letar efter sin mamma hittar de bara andra kycklingar, som alla är lika vilsna. De får lära sig hitta mat och vatten på egen hand. Mat och vatten är också allt som finns att upptäcka i fabrikslokalen. Industrin vill ha kycklingar som växer fort. Men deras skelett klarar inte av så tunga kroppar och de flesta kycklingar har ont och haltar. Varje dag plockas döda och döende kycklingar från golvet. Begäret efter det populära vita köttet dödar 90 miljoner fåglar varje år, bara i Sverige. Grisfabriken är en plats utan glädje. Det är en ogästvänlig värld som kultingarna kommer till. Golven är hårda och kala. De flesta smågrisar får sår på benen av att ligga på betonggolv. Suggorna har avlats för att föda så många grisar som möjligt i varje kull. De får vara med sina ungar i en månad innan de skiljs åt för alltid. Efter det insemineras suggan för att så fort som möjligt föda fler kultingar. Att föda och ge dig till så många så tätt gör att suggorna magrar av. Magra suggor får lätt liggsår eftersom golven är så hårda. Många ungar är dödfödda eller föds mycket svaga. Nästan var femte kulting dör innan de når fem veckors ålder. De flesta svälter ihjäl eftersom de är för svaga för att dia. I reklamens värld är det alltid sommar i mjölkfabriken. Vi har matats med en bild av lyckliga betande kor som generöst delar med sig av sin mjölk. Men det är långt ifrån vardagen i mjölkfabriken. I Sverige hålls många kor uppbundna. Större delen av sitt liv kan de inte röra sig överhuvudtaget. Låsta av en kedja runt halsen kan de inte klia eller tvätta sig själva, bara stå upp eller ligga ner. Idag blir det allt vanligare att korna går lösa i fabrikerna. Det är trångt, hårt och ofta smutsigt. Även under sommaren får korna hållas inomhus 18 timmar om dygnet. Vissa får inte komma ut alls. 
Det kan vara lätt att tro att det går att ta ägg från hönor utan att någon kommer till skada. Men äggfabriken hör till den mest industrialiserade av all djurhållning. Här har hönorna förvandlats från fåglar till äggmaskiner. Omkring en miljon hönor i Sverige lever hela sina liv i burar. Trängseln är så stor att de knappt kan röra sig. En enskild höna är nästan ingenting värd i äggfabriken. Det enda som räknas är äggen. Det spelar ingen roll om djurfabriken är ekologisk eller om djuren används för kött, mjölk eller ägg. Till slut kommer alla till dödsfabriken, slakteriet. Grisar bedövas med koldioxidgas. Det tar runt en minut innan de är helt medvetslösa. Grisarna kippar efter luft och kämpar för att ta sig ut. Det gör ont att andas in gasen. Efter avblodning görs djurens kroppar i ordning för konsumtion. Här förvandlas de från kännande individer till anonyma produkter i kyldiskan. But I think it, because this is this is a part of a movie called Jule Fabriken, which was um, published quite recently. I think most of the images, or I think, are are fresh, are from the last couple of years at least. So I don't think they're very old. And you can see if you want to see the whole or or share with others, you you have if you go into julefabriken.se, you can find it there. How many know about LRF? Uh, there are sometimes that uh, some of these images comes out in the media that you saw in the video, uh, like uh, on the TV news. And what happens then? Well, then uh, organizations like LIF, which is Landbrukarna Sixbund, uh, the Swedish, the, what was it, the Swedish, the Federation of Swedish Farmers, which is one of the most powerful lobbying uh, organizations for the farming industry. Then they go out and they try to defend uh, the industry uh, in different ways. And uh, they have 150,000 members only in Sweden. Uh, so there are many and they have, uh, I think, a good, a good economy. We have one example of that. Uh, and that was when uh, a school in Nyköping in the municipality decided that they, they should try meatless Mondays for environmental reasons, you know, we have to cut down on meat because it uh, hurts the, the, the planet, the environment. Uh, but uh, LIF, uh, they thought, no, um, uh, we want the kids to have meat every single day. So what did they do? Well, they went out, they had a grill, uh, the barbecue, and they, uh, outside of the school, and they gave uh, these hamburgers uh, for free to the uh, pupils uh, at the Meatless Monday. Uh, and there was a reporter, and uh, they asked Luisa Nove, which was the initiative, uh, took the initiative to this um, burger uh, uh, happening. Uh, wh why? Why do you do this? And she said, um, we just want the kids to get enough nutrition every day. It's especially important for the girls who want to grow, do sports, and become beautiful. And uh, this got quite a, f quite a few reactions in the media and social media and it was criticized and also laughed at uh, this kind of idea that you need uh, me to become beautiful. And I think that shows uh, that uh, these norms about meat and how we need meat is actually being challenged and uh, not seen as, as truth uh, so much anymore. And that's helpful. 
uh, the farms and the animal industry, they need us to think about different animal, animals differently. They have no problem with this. Cuddling and uh, hugging cats or dogs, no problem at all. Uh, but they don't want us to do the same with, an, uh, with pigs and cows and uh, other animals that are seen as food. They don't want us to, like I'm doing here, having a nice relaxed uh, sunny day with Alien at the farm sanctuary at Gotland. He's a very nice pig, I can tell you. Very <laughs> cuddly. Um, of course, uh, the farming industries, the, far the factory farms, are not the only one uh, doing political work. We also have organizations from the animal rights uh, movement, like Mercy for Animals, uh, and many, many others, of course, uh, trying to affect the way we treat animals. Uh, and they want to uh, challenge uh, this uh, arbitrary difference many of us make between uh, these kind of different animals. And they do that uh, with videos, for example. And uh, we're going to see one if you want to press play. Showing to some compassion in their message, in, in the way they produce food. And one of the examples that have been successful is Swedish Oatly, of course. It's like made, but made for humans. Um, and of course, this is a possibility for uh, all companies that uh, work in animal exploitation to, to make this transition into to vegan products. I think uh, that would be possible. If not all, uh, uh, most of them can, could do that if they wanted to, and if they are having enough in incentives or pressure enough. Now we have talked about these different reasons, psychological, sociological and political reasons for why we eat meat, but also some reasons why we don't have to eat meat. Um, and I was thinking you can talk about this maybe, uh, what reasons or forces have shaped your relationship to animals and food in your life? <coughs> in any of these areas really, can you think about uh, that for a while and maybe share? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, frågan är, Det är för att man inte har det här. Jag 
uh, but especially in this rich, rich world, uh, if you have lived here, uh, hopefully you haven't uh, experienced very much suffering. But how would it be to live a, a life of, of an animal? Um, I was thinking we could do a thought experiment, if you would uh, do that with me. And uh, I, I would invite you to close your eyes uh, for some moments, uh, to imagine something with me. Um, try to imagine that you're now being born, not in, in a hospital, but in a factory. You instinctively try to find someone who can take care of you, but you find no one. You're only surrounded by other babies, screaming and searching for comfort, just like you. You feel alone and scared. Suddenly, you are partially thrown into a box with others. You are disoriented, you can hardly breathe and you are thirsty. Your leg hurts like hell. It was probably broken when someone threw you in the box. You hear the sound of an engine. For hours you are stuck in the box, thinking you can't survive much longer. You panic, but there is no one that can help you. Suddenly, it all stops, and you are thrown into a very big room with thousands of others. From then on, you are living uh, in this crowded room. You never get to see the sun. You never get to experience living in a family. You are always stressed because at any moment you can be attacked by a stranger in the room. Your injury never healed, so your leg hurts. Uh, your, your leg hurts constantly. All of this is a part of a chicken's life in Sweden, 2016. You can open your eyes now. Could you feel a little bit of that pain? Maybe by trying to imagine. And now try to multiply this with 90 million, the number of 90 million, because that is how many chickens who were put in this kind of life uh, and killed for food, only in Sweden, only for one year, only last year, 90 million. It's of course impossible to do that for us, but uh, that gives an idea about uh, how much suffering we're talking about. Uh, but uh, caring for animals uh, and their suffering it is not the only thing that uh, could affect us uh, and the way we think about food. Uh, more and more we um, realize in the world how much meat is also and, and other animal products is influencing the environment. And uh, in uh, 2006, a UN report came uh, called the Livestock's Long Shadow. Uh, and in the report, it said uh, this uh, Livestock are responsible for 80% of greenhouse gas emissions A bigger share than that of transport And uh, with other words, uh, if you uh, compare the meat and milk industry With uh, other kinds of industries, with, with, with everything that has to do with the transport Cars, airplanes, boats uh, the meat industry and animal industry is actually causing more problems with the climate crisis than all trans. Yes? You sure it's not 80% of uh, the 100% of agriculture? Or what? It's 80% of the total, not of 80% of the 12% of the agriculture? No, it's total. Are you sure of that? There are actually other uh, survey surveys that have even a larger uh, number than 18 percent, but that's the, the total uh, worldwide. I should say this is worldwide. That's surprising, I say, Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's surprising, and I think because even today they're talking a lot about uh, how we must uh, drive less, right, uh, because of fossil fuels, fuels, but uh, not so much about meat. I think it's coming more and more, maybe you see that, I mean, uh, people are more aware today than just a couple of years ago uh, that meat is contributing to climate crisis. Is this just uh, livestock or is it, is it uh, agriculture in all? 
This is just yeah, livestock. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And of course, I mean, uh, other kinds of food production contributes as well, but, but not even close to this amount. Is it three fourths that uh, out of all growing the crops is for livestock? Doesn't? Right, yeah, I actually have a number. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, like 70% of all land is uh, for livestock. Yeah, that's something close to what you say. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, and how about health? Um, there was a study done by the Harvard Medical School, uh, one of the largest in the world. They followed 120,000 people uh, for a period of 25 years in their lives and uh, looked at how does uh, food uh, affect their health. And one of the researchers, Professor Frank B. Hugh, uh, behind this study, he said uh, this. This study uh, provides clear evidence that regular consumption of red meat, especially processed meat, contributes substantially to premature death. Uh, quite clear evidence that uh, it's also affecting our health and our uh, whole uh, medical system in the world, uh, the way we eat. And no one, no researcher today uh, says that uh, we uh, suffer because of lack of meat. We know today that uh, we, uh, on the contrary, uh, need uh, to eat uh, less meat, less, less um, animal products for a good health. Um, but if you want to build muscles, uh, you need meat, right? Well, we can ask this fellow. He. Uh, this is Derek Tursais. He uh, was vegan since he was 90 years old. Where do you think he gets his protein from? Only from uh, vegetables and uh, lentils and such. Uh, starvation is uh, a huge problem today. More than 1 billion people today don't get enough food to sustain their health. And uh, now we come to, to your also figure because uh, we said 70% is uh, uh, for livestock. If we would instead grow food on more of that land, uh, it, it could, if we took all that land uh, and uh, had it for vegetables that we had directly as human um, food, then uh, we would get 10 to 20 times more food. And, uh, of course, that's not the only solution for starvation, but uh, it could help uh, tremendously of decreasing this number of one billion. But uh, we have uh, much uh, land that we don't can grow anything out um, on only have uh, animals on. It's true. No, not not every piece of land uh, you can uh, grow human food, but I think a lot of that seventy percent. Uh, maybe we should uh, ask you in agriculture. 40% <laughs> is going to cut directly. Sorry? 40% is going to cut the directly. Uh, directly. 40% is going to grow from the available uh, land for agriculture. But from this 40% uh, of the crop, a lot of land is dedicated to soya and all the rest things that are going to cows. Exactly. So and, and I think this 70%. The supporting uh, food. More than the meadow, for example. Yeah. I think this 70% is both for grazing, like uh, having uh, cattle, but it's also for uh, growing food for the animals. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, but that is food. So we use it in Sweden, we use 75% of the arable land to, to the animals. Mm, 75 in Sweden. And the animals that we eat them. So instead of having animals, we can eat the. Um, yeah, food from this uh, 75 arable land is directly. But uh, and that question, do you know that how much of that land could be used for? Uh, uh, uh -huh. no, I don't know. No. But, uh, <coughs> if I remember correctly, it's um, according to Jordbrugs I get uh, mm -hmm. around 15 percent of, um, say, like all the land we use to grow things. It's 15 percent. That's for grazing. Uh -huh. 
So if you count that to like the entire area, like the entire area of Sweden, mm -hmm. that will be around like 0.1% of all our land. But that is from the whole Sweden. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, things are beginning to happen. Uh, this is the US meat consumption. And you can see here, um, it has gone up and up and up. Uh, the US is among those that eat most meat in the world. But you see a very clear trend uh, downwards in the last couple of years. Uh, and this is uh, something that I find very hopeful. And uh, we have uh, people like uh, Woody Harrelson, uh, Ellen DeMeres, uh, Toby McGuire, Natalie Portman, uh, Brad Pitt, and Mike Tyson. Some of those uh, celebrities that have gone vegan, what I have heard. Um, we don't have very many in Sweden, now we are a smaller country. But um, they say that um, all or most of the trends from the US comes uh, here to Sweden. And in this case, uh, this vegan trend, that would be uh, very welcome uh, to me. And I see also in Sweden, you see more uh, Articles, letters to the editor um, that challenge this uh, meat norm and uh, tries to uh, challenge it with uh, a veggie norm instead. Uh, we have a party uh, that could be maybe a sign of these uh, things growing uh, for the animals, viewers, that uh, took part in European Parliament elections and also national elections. And uh, not less than three uh, magazines came in the last couple of years, uh, either vegan or vegetarian. Uh, and that's maybe also a sign that this trend is growing with uh, more vegetarian and vegan food. Um, and to wrap up, uh, there has been uh, different struggles in our history. There has been the struggles for uh, the women to vote, uh, freedom struggles, and struggles for human rights. Uh, and I think we have a lot to, to be thankful for, uh, for living uh, after these struggles, because they uh, managed to uh, uh, do so much for us humans. But uh, now there is another movement coming, uh, stronger and stronger, I feel, the one for the animals. Uh, the difference is that they can't fight for themselves. The animals don't have a voice. It's we who have to be the ambassadors for the animals. Uh, but I think that uh, step by step, uh, if we choose uh, not to uh, contribute to uh, the suffering by uh, consuming their products, and also to become active in different ways for animals, I do think uh, we can uh, change it uh, for the better. With uh, those words, uh, I want to thank you, and I look forward to having a bit more discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Is there uh, something you want to share? Questions or thoughts, comments? I want to ask one question. Yeah, sure. We briefly talked about how much land is used for grazing in Sweden. And I have a friend who is a biologist and she, she works with the land and stuff. So every time we, I argue with her, she says that the cows that graze on, on Swedish land, mm -hmm. they are responsible for the biodiversity. So if we are to remove, like, imaginary scenario, if we are to remove the cows tomorrow, mm -hmm. that land that they graze on, that we, Sweden is going to lose a lot of biodiversity. Right. At first time I didn't know how to answer because I never thought about that. And then I thought, well, in USA, in different parts of Europe, like uh, the wild grazing animals like the buffalo is being reintroduced. So is it, do you know if, you, if it's possible to move the cows and to, to replace them with uh, something else so that uh, we don't need cows for biodiversity? <laughs> I think there are many different uh, answers to that question. I mean, if you look, I'm not an expert on this, I'm sure there are others, maybe I can let you in, but... I mean, Sweden has been covered by forest, I think, most of the country, right? In today we have much less forest. So if you want to talk about the natural environment, I think that's the most natural environment that we have, uh, if you want to go for that. Then, of course, uh, 
of course, it, it's different in different parts of the country, but m m many parts were covered by forest and, and are not today. Uh, but of course, uh, those that have had graze uh, yeah, cattle uh, or cows, uh, it, it has um, gi has given new kind of uh, biodiversity. Uh, but you don't have to have uh, cows for milk or meat. Yeah. You can have uh, you can maybe have wild animals. Uh, on the other hand, I mean we have many animals that uh, don't ever go out and graze like pigs. So maybe we can stop with that uh, first. And the cows, I mean, uh, they graze very little of the whole year. It's a very small percentage. It's really uh, only a few uh, months in the summer that they are out grazing. I mean, for meat, meat, um, uh, those animals would we'll say shut uh, cool. Of course, they are out uh, a bit more than the dairy cows. Anyone else want to add uh, no, no support? Yeah. I just want to say I am to this guy. I know that the cows came to you, at least to you or from the Middle East. Sorry? The cows yeah. were domesticated from the Middle East uh -huh. to you, or at least the doves came. Yes. Of course, every domestication is something that we have introduced. So uh, it's not native and to, to milk cow in Europe at least. No, exactly. so in this sense it's a matter of negotiation, what is the natural biodiversity, do, do we want to go back 100 years or 200 or the time before, before exactly. cows and so we can have great forests again. And also, I mean, you have to compare, the climate crisis I would say is the, environmentally the biggest challenge we have on our planet. Uh, you have to, and cows contribute to that a lot, so you have to balance that if you want this biodiversity uh, to that other challenge, and can you find ways to... <laughs> but w when this guy say uh, to go back 200 years back, uh, 200 years back probably it was undomesticated, and I'm coming to what I, I said before, it's domesticated today, you have, mm -hmm. you have to understand, I have to understand that I'm playing the role in that, at least. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I feel like this, that if we were to take away some cows and let the forest grow again, mm -hmm. the air would be more pure. So I think that even though we would lose maybe a few butterflies or whatever, mm -hmm. we as a species mm -hmm. would gain so much from regrowing forests. Yeah, probably. I mean, according to her words, it was more than just a few species. It was a lot of different yeah, and stuff, so uh, it was very, it was first. But it's not as if we're gonna let uh, all, everything grow back to forest yeah. again, but <coughs> yeah, I, I got mad at a person at one point, and I even told them, so let's keep the cow, so let them be, and you say that we need cow poop to grow food, <laughs> so go poop a soup then. But I know that was quite silly, but. <laughs> Yeah, give the solution, but... <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at the same time, if you look worldwide, animal agriculture is the biggest reason for species extinction. Mm. So, of course, you can look at Sweden and say, yeah, there's a, a bunch of, I don't know how many species on this mm. field, but then if you look at it worldwide, we still need to cut down our meat consumption. Mm. Mm. You can also ask yourself, Okay, we care about biodiversity in our landscapes, but do we have the right to exploit animals just because we care for that? Why? Why should we take, take that right? Well, Sorry? It's just a man made landscape. Yeah. There's nothing natural, natural about it at all. Yeah. But also, the biodiversity is more um, the different types of insects, for example, that uh, the bees and the bumblebees who pollinate our. Plants that we in turn can eat. Mm -hmm. So it's very important uh, that they have their habitat. habitat. So, yeah, so we exactly. need the, the biodiversity. It's not just like, I don't think it's a mm -hmm. simple question, but uh, it's it's had to be questioned and uh, discussed. And uh, so yeah. it's important not just accept oh we need cows because of the biodiversity. Full stop. No. Mm -hmm. But we have to analyze but it. Do you think we can solve that without domestication well, yeah. of uh, all the animals? I, I, I'm going to do my thesis about like a hypothetical vegan Sweden and uh, look 
which amount of uh, animals we need for uh, this open landscape. Mm -hmm. And of course, I want to see. Of course, I also ask my, the questions: uh, open landscape, why? But, uh, and biodiversity, why? And blah blah blah. So There's many questions in this uh, these topics, I think. But I want to check uh, how many animals we need and the animals uh, they are going to live there as long as they uh, don't. The cows can be maybe 20 years old or more. Mm -hmm. So they are going to live. They are going to graze and have a happy life. That is my. But of course, it's uh, <coughs> problems because uh, we have this society building which some way, and now we have to think in another way and uh, mm -hmm. change. And uh, your uh, hand I don't know, yeah. uh, it's Ellen Rust, right? Yeah. Yes. And I know she does studies on this also. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm so. going to build uh, additional scenarios on this. Mm -hmm. She has uh, other scenarios where she they use, they take the meat, they take the meat, they take the egg. But in my scenario, there will be vegan, mm -hmm. vegan scenario, but maybe including animals. So, uh, do we come back to you in a couple of years? And <laughs> yeah, I hope it's not a couple of years. <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Uh, I think if you want to have some more fika over there, uh, if, if it's still open. Uh, yeah, I, I have some material for my project. Uh, it's all free if you want to have a look, except for the books. Uh, I take 50 kroner each. Uh, and uh, for the records, uh, it, it goes to Jurats Alliance and Jurats Set if you want to give a contribution for a record. I want to say something, yes. Yes. Um, I was thinking when we saw the cute video with the dog and the little, little pig, and I was thinking how we want the animals to be cute all the time. And also, I mean, the, we have a, the big pig maybe playing or something. It's just, so it's not how they look. I mean, they, even if they are ugly or something, they they have rights to their lives. Right. And, uh, and even, I mean, some people, oh yeah, they can't feel pain. Uh, okay, but does that give us right to take their lives just because they can't feel pain? Or how do you, do you really know that? Mm. Yeah, I, I focus mostly on the suffering and I think that's a psychological reason because mm. I found that most people care more about suffering than taking a life. Mm. But I agree with you, taking a life should be uh, also very important. What gives us the right to actually end the life? When it comes to human lives, that's the most important if you look at the law, right? To murder someone is much more serious than to uh, hurt someone physically, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's an interesting question and I find why is it different to humans and animals? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for coming and give yourself a big hand.